Welcome back to Gen Z Speaks. Uh, we have a really special guest today, Ty Smith. Ty Smith served 20 years in the US Navy as a military police officer prior to 9-11 and then as a Navy SEAL officer post 9-11. Uh, he is the current founder and CEO of ComSafe AI, which is a technology company that disrupts emerging threats of conflicts and violence. He was deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan six times uh, and earned various military awards, including the Bronze Star Medal and a Navy Joint Commendation Medal, both with distinguished honors. Thank you so much for coming on, Ty. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Let, let's, let's dive right in, man. Um, Obviously, man, you've had a really long decorated military career. Uh, I want to kind of start off. I know you grew up in Louisiana and, and you went to, is that right? I did not. I grew up in Illinois, in East St. Louis, my, right on the uh, Illinois-Missouri border. Oh, my apologies. Right. So when you grew up in Illinois, uh, you said you went straight to the military after high school. I, I did. Why, why did you, you know, choose that decision? And what was that like going straight to the military from high school? Well, I, I chose to go right into the Navy for a couple of reasons. Um, first and foremost, I, I didn't have anything else. I wasn't ready for college at the time. I, I didn't have employment lined up. You know, I came from a, a pretty poor family, like most families growing up in a place like East St. Louis. Uh, it's not the nicest, kindest place in the world. So you just kind of make do it what you have every day and every day you know your priority is just staying alive you know and not being caught up in some type of gang shootout or you know being harassed by the cops just because of the color of your skin and you happen to be walking by the wrong neighborhood so you're really just living day to day and you're not focused on anything that that young men and women at that age should be focused on so i didn't have anything else to do uh, is the long and short of it but also when I was 12 years old, I, I made the decision that I wanted to be a Navy SEAL someday. So at least I had a dream in my back pocket and that was all I had. So I ran with it. Right. Um, you know, when, when you entered the, the Navy, it, it was a very different time, right? In 1996, uh, you said that you were stationed in Italy and, you know, initially things weren't, uh, what did you envision your role to be in the Navy initially when you first joined? Because obviously things changed and 9-11 happened, but before that, uh, what, did you think of your, what did you think of your role specifically within the Navy and what that life would be like? Well, when I was joining the Navy, I had no idea because you don't know what you don't know. Um, I, I was an 18 year old punk kid from East St. Louis. I thought I knew everything, but I didn't know anything. Uh, and it wasn't until later in life you know, that I truly realized that I'll be 43 next week. And if there's anything I've learned in 43 years is that I still don't know anything. So I need to keep going. I need to keep learning. But I knew that I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. And I knew that, you know, even at an early age, I started to realize that no one can really prevent me from, from doing what I say I'm going to do. No one can really prevent me from achieving the goals that I set for myself. Um, it wasn't that it wasn't until I joined the SEAL teams that I learned that I could literally go around over or through any obstacle that is placed in front of me when it comes to me achieving my goals. But I knew that I, I would become a Navy SEAL someday. I just I had no idea what that would look like. I had no idea. And when I got into the Navy, um, I started out as a military police officer and an Italian translator in Sardinia, Italy. And I was just having a time in my life. It was a blast. You know, I learned a new culture. I learned a new language. I was, I was growing up. So I was gaining some maturity. Um, it wasn't really until, and, and I mean, I was training to, to finally get into, into SEAL training. And I was having some issues at my command at the time. They were having some administrative and leadership challenges. So I was having a hard time getting my package approved to go to SEAL training. But even during that time, I was preparing and really just focusing on, on being the base translator and, and still living as a young and single, you know, 20, 21 year old guy in Sardinia, Italy. So uh, I hadn't really matured to the point where, you know, I was building processes in my life that would allow me to track, you know, toward how close am I to, to getting into SEAL training and 
no, I, I was just a young dude and I was trying to figure it out. And 9-11 happened and it fast tracked everything. A week later, my, my package for SEAL training was miraculously approved. And by February 2002, uh, I was in Coronado where I live to this day, uh, being indoctrinated into the very cold water of the, the Pacific Ocean and the, the, the mentality of Naval Special Warfare instructors when they're the gatekeepers regarding whether you're going to be allowed to enter that really secretive community or not. Right. Yeah. Ty, you know, I always hear about how intense, uh, you know, Navy SEALs training is and how, you know, it affects people, you know, people break down in that training. People, you know, have to go back and it's, it's really uh, difficult, you know, uh, could you comment on how, how Na uh, Navy SEAL training went for you and, and, you know, what you got out of it, what you learned from it? Yeah, that's a great question. So training for me, I, I think training went great. I think that I performed uh, really well throughout training. Uh, but I think that's a testament to my focus. When I was preparing for SEAL training, that was all I saw. It was all I, I ate, slept, breathed. Um, when I devote myself to a cause, I am that cause. I become that cause and I obsess over it. And like I said, I don't allow obstacles to get in my way. I go around them, over them, or I go through them if I have to. So SEAL training just taught me what I already knew inherently, which is I'm a protector of other human beings. Even growing up, my mom would tell me, you never get in fights at school unless you're protecting someone else. You're standing up for someone else. SEAL training just really lit that fire in me and, and made me realize that, hey, you're part of something that's bigger than yourself. And not just in training, but in life. You're going through life with other human beings. You have to build relationships with those people. And you have to, you have to be more than just a protector of people on the battlefield. You have to be a protector of people in regular life as well. And SEAL training just taught me how to hone that. It gave me the confidence that I needed to know that nothing can stop me. I don't care what the goal is. I don't care what it is. If I decide I'm going to do it and I say that I'm going to accomplish that goal, count on it. It's as simple as that. And navigating SEAL training taught me that I'm absolutely capable of doing anything that I put my mind to and say that I'm going to do. I love that. I love that obsessive uh, mentality. It's awesome. Yeah, it definitely is awesome. So like moving, moving in through like SEAL training and then obviously getting deployed, it just seems like what, what you've said so far, it just, it seems like a lot of values have been, were like developed during that time. Right. And I'm sure being like on your first deployment, there's a lot going through your head, you know, um, based on off of that first experience. And then maybe I, I'm not sure how many times you were deployed, but uh, maybe middle of your deployments in, in total, what was the progressive change? Like, how did that develop? Now, you know what? That's a really interesting question. And it's a really, really good question. Because when I entered the SEAL teams, I think I was 23 years old. And in my opinion, I was still really immature. I, I was really immature. I was I knew I was behind because, like I said, I grew up in a place like East St. Louis where education isn't valued. Um, I was, I knew I was behind my peers. And so when I got into the SEAL teams, I learned really quickly that I had a lot to learn and that I'd be better suited keeping my mouth shut as much as I possibly can. And just being a sponge and taking in as much as I can from as, as much as I could from the older operators. And when we got to Afghanistan, my very first uh, deployment, number one out of six tours in the Middle East. I think when I first got there, I didn't really know what to expect other than I knew that we would see combat. I knew that that there is a, a likelihood that I could get hurt really bad and that my teammates could get hurt really bad. But I would say it probably was around the halfway point where I, I started to realize how not just how important the work that we were doing was, but how serious it was. Um, and, and I realized that because that was my first time at war. And, and I realized some really important things like this is for real. This is not TV. 
bullets will kill you making mistakes under fire will kill you being a cowboy and not not following orders correctly or or being a rascal and and not communicating correctly and and being the kind of person that isn't thinking about the person to your left and your right obsessively especially while bullets are flying not only will it kill you but even worse it will kill your teammates the people that you care about more than anything in the world and so i think uh, that that first deployment i just i gained some maturity and and to be honest with you i if i wasn't already bitten by the bug of doing that type of of work i was certainly bitten by it during that deployment probably around the halfway mark that's extremely interesting so i've i've never known a seal personally um but i have known i've known people in the navy my dad's a marine himself um awesome. so yeah so i know military members and among those military members i know some of them were very gung ho or cowboyish like you described and it just seems interesting that they they went in with that mindset and they're there and you know just as you said it's a different it's completely different than going in thinking yeah i'm going to go kill some you know and you know going with that gung ho mindset so i mean i guess that's what differentiates you guys as seals right that you guys are able to be rational and be able to be cool under those situations um, unlike those gung ho or cowboy members so when you were dealing with like those people was it just were you kind of kind of disregarding them or did you actually try to maybe talk some sense into them and like eh, that's not the best way to do this you know no i just tried to stay away from those people because make no mistake you do have people people do find people that don't belong absolutely find their way into the seal teams just like any other organization just like any other organization of people you're going to have a certain percentage of those people that are rotten just like law enforcement just like any demographic of people doesn't matter how they look what color they are where they come from what religion they practice it doesn't matter if you take a group of people the larger that test set is the, the larger that percentage of of cancer is going to be within that group and so the seal teams is no different you know there were plenty of guys that i met in the seal teams where i didn't like them i knew they didn't like me and we respected one another by staying the hell away from one another and i thought that that was the best i thought that was the best tactic for me to take because i was already at a disadvantage you know first and foremost i was a a brand new guy when when i got into the seal teams at the age of 23 but also i'm a minority you know african americans make up less than 1% of the operators in the seal teams so in in my opinion it's unfortunate but the seal teams isn't necessarily a meritocracy um and and people are judged based on who they're friends with um unfortunately men that look like me get judged based off of our skin color so i knew that everything that i did had to be bigger better faster stronger than everyone else just so that i didn't give guys a reason to say he doesn't belong so that was another reason why you know if i had a problem with someone depending on that problem i just stayed away from that person um instead of taking a combative stance of 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 telling that person how i felt about them or that i didn't think that they deserved to be there because i knew that 9 times out of 10 everyone else would side with that person and not me and i was listening to one of your podcasts that you did uh, last year and you talked about how in your navy seal training you know a, a lot of the people who were training you hadn't really been in combat and, and for the first time you know in iraq and afghanistan they were going into combat what was that like you know going into combat that first time i know you talked about how uh you know you didn't really have an idea what you were getting yourself into but you know going in with people who trained you who really didn't have any prior actual on the ground combat experience what was that like it was surreal more than more than anything i think it was just surreal it was something that i dreamed about doing my entire life and i mean literally i dreamt about it my entire life from the time i was a little kid all the way through you know me checking into seal training i i had dreams of what it would be like to be an operator when i was going through seal training i would i would have dreams about what it would be like being in afghanistan or being in iraq 
And when I finally got there, you know, it, it, it felt surreal, but it also felt special. Like I, I knew right away that I had become a member of a really special community of, of special operations commandos. And it's one of those things that it's hard to explain. You kind of got to be there, but, but to see SEALs prosecuting a target the way that we do, and we do it better than any special operations group on the planet, it's a really cool and special thing to see. So more than anything, it, it was surreal. So one of my, one of my dads, uh, he wasn't, he was my dad's buddy. Um, they went to high school together. They both joined the Marines, didn't end up in the same platoon, but my dad's buddy, his name's George. He was in for over 20 years, I believe 20 to 25 years. Um, and he ended up being a commanding officer and he, I believe he did six tours as well. Um, and I, he never mentions it because I think it's a prideful thing and respect thing to the military, but I don't feel as if his veteran his VA benefits were as good as they should have right he's over there for over 20 years you know defending this country and like the honor that we carry and it turns out that they kind of kick him to the curb afterwards right sure his family was taken care of while he was in in the service and he gets a, a set amount every month but I don't believe that set I believe it's about four to five grand a month and I don't believe that justifies any of it um, how do you feel about the VA benefits post uh, you know, post? Well, you know, it, it's kind of, VA benefits are, are one of those things that I try not to complain about because things could always be worse, right? You could always have less and I'm married, I have children, and because I'm retired from the Navy, and because I did well throughout my career, I retired as a, as a senior chief, I was an enlisted, I was an, an officer, actually. Um, you know, my, my family, they never have to worry about how we're going to pay for medical bills, how are we going to pay for dental bills, how am I going to put my children through college, we don't have those problems. And those are problems that 99% of the people in this country have and those are very serious very expensive problems and, and in sometimes they're life-threatening problems right so I, I try not to complain about it but I certainly understand what you're saying Matt because trust there were plenty of times when I was overseas and the thought flashed through my mind I'm not being paid enough for what I'm doing right now you know, uh, but no one forced me to do that. I volunteered. I raised my hand and said, send me, I'll go, you know, so I, so I can't really complain about that. Now, the last part is that for decades, the VA has been all janked up and everyone knows it, including the VA. The good news is that the VA is, is now aware of that and they're trying to make changes in order to make the access to, to benefits better for veterans as they transition out of the military. They still got a very long way to go, a very long way to go. But I know that things are better now than they were even just 10 years ago. So you have to look at it. it, it it's a complex problem. You can't look at it from the standpoint of, well, the veterans should just get more because in my opinion, the veterans should always get more. You know, your, your dad gave more than two decades of his life to this country and he made sacrifices that you don't even know he made yet. You'll understand them someday, you know, but veterans are, are for some reason in this country, they are never compensated you know, at the level in which they should be compensated. We, we, we go out and we pay these professional athletes millions of dollars every year, you know, to, to run around on a basketball court or a football field looking cool and throwing balls around. And yeah, we're entertained and it's great, you know, but I, I've, I've lost brothers and sisters to these wars, you know, and, and like you said, the benefits that their families are getting now, it's something, but it's not enough. So I think that in this country as a whole, our priorities are misaligned. And that's something that 
we have to deal with as a society of people that's not just on the VA. I could definitely agree with that. It, it's very intricate. And I believe that when it comes down to it, it's the whole mindset thing, right? When, when you're a veteran and, you know, it's like the woe is me thing, of course, it's going to be worse on you. But when you have the mindset that you have and it's like things can be worse and that's the reality of it, they can always be worse. So I can also, I can really appreciate that. For sure. I think it's really fascinating what you mentioned about that. It's not just the VA thing. It's a society thing that as a society, right? We prioritize or idolize certain people over other people. And, and kind of lose sight of what's important and who's actually, you know, making the sacrifices on ground. And I think that's something that we have to deal with ourselves internally. And then our leaders will reflect that mentality eventually. Uh, I, I do want to ask you, you know, you mentioned that uh, a lot of veterans experience, you know, mental health problems while they're in service. Uh, and they kind of, you know, sometimes question their place in, in their roles. During the war, did you ever question your, your place in your purpose in Iraq or Afghanistan when you were, you know, conducting these combat troops? Um, and, and did you ever think that what you were, you know, what you were doing was, did you ever question what the morality of what you were doing? Never. Not once. I knew. I knew why I was in those places. I knew why we were in those places. And I agreed, and I still agree with American troops deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan, because when it comes down to it, and this is barring politics, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not political. I, I am, I am not a Republican. I am a Democrat. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm an American period. That's it. And I'm a patriot of this country doesn't matter what party you belong to. Personally, I think we should get rid of all the parties because when you start out a conversation by acknowledging that you're different, you're already agreeing that you're not gonna accomplish a goddamn thing. So I always agreed with our decision to go to those places because there are people suffering in those places and they were suffering at the hands of horrible leadership. And in Saddam Hussein's case, evil leadership. And so, I think it, it's good that we went to those places. I just think we did it wrong, to be honest with you. You know, I, Afghanistan became the forever war. You know, I, I deployed to that place for the first time in 2004 as a brand new operator. And I went back at the end of the war, you know, in, in, in 2014, uh, same stomping ground. I'd been a couple of deployments before that and nothing had changed. So it wasn't until after I retired from the SEAL teams that I began to question. And it was never a question of, of was it morally right that we invaded Iraq and Afghanistan? Because I believe that we were morally right by doing that. All of my questions after I retired revolve around, okay, now what was all of it for? <laughs> what did we accomplish? What did we change? I, I can't tell you one thing that we changed. I can't tell you one way that we made Iraq or Afghanistan better because those places are exactly the same, you know, but I can tell you approximately how many funerals I've attended over the years of, of people that I cared about a whole lot and people that gave their lives for this country in those places. So those questions didn't really start to develop for me until after. I want to go back to how you were talking about the Navy SEAL training and, and, you know, obviously you mentioned you've put a lot of your friends, man, to, you know, to rest and uh, obviously Navy SEAL training involves a lot of physical toughness, right? But a lot of the mental toughness that comes in, you can only really experience it when you, like you went to combat, right? And, and that's something that really can't be taught. You really have to learn, right, on the ground. Um, what, what, how did you deal with that experience with the loss of life? I, I mean, you know, as a young person who joined the military like yourself, you know, you didn't really, I don't, I don't know if you anticipated that, you know, deep loss of life. And so in dealing with, you know, such uh, complex problems and putting, you know, your loved ones, those who you served with, those who, you know, you wanted to protect, um, how did you deal? And I, I know a lot of veterans have difficulty. I just want to get, get, get to get to know how you dealt with that loss of life. I didn't, I didn't deal with it while I was on active duty. You learn to ignore and override. And 
continue mission. There is no time for being emotional. There is no time for mourning. That train is moving at 100 miles an hour and it's not gonna slow down or stop for anyone. So you have to keep up. I didn't start dealing with that stuff until after I retired. Then I started dealing with it. And when it catches up to you, it catches up to you like a thief in the night and it hits you like a ton of bricks. And it's a very, very heavy and painful burden to carry. Yeah, definitely. I, I've heard stories of obviously like um, my dad's stories and his friend's stories. And, you know, it's, it's difficult because I mean, you're literally brothers, right? You guys are watching each other's backs and I just, I can't imagine myself being that, but I always, in, in middle school, I always told my dad, I want to be a Marine. I want to be like you. I want to go in and serve. I want to see where I can go. And he was like, no, you're not going to do that. That's why I did it. So you don't have to do it. And, you know, now that I'm at a state or I'm at an age where I, reflection is a lot better, right? I'm able to reflect and look at it and say, wow, I, I, it's extremely difficult to put myself in those shoes, to experience that and develop the way you guys did develop. Um, how, now that you, obviously you said, you know, there was no time to be emotional and now's a time to be reflective. How do you reflect on those days? Do you, you know, what like large aspects, um, came into your head while you're being reflective? I think that these days I reflect a lot better than I used to, you know, the, 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 the default uh, that we're taught inadvertently in the military is that reflection comes by way of basically alcoholism. And uh, that is not healthy. It's not conducive to healing. And so fortunately, I was able to grow through that. Over the last six years, I've been retired from the SEAL teams. Now, when I reflect, you know, I, I just try, I try to focus on my gratitude. I try to focus on gratitude. I, I try to focus on the fact that I still got 10 fingers and 10 toes. And for the most part, I'm still whole, especially compared to some of my brothers and sisters that didn't fare as well as I did. I try to focus on, on good times. I try to focus on times that I shared with those people while they were here instead of mourning the fact that they are no longer here. And, and listen, I'm no different from anyone else. I, I have good days and I have bad days, just like every other combat veteran that, that experienced combat at the level that I experienced it and as much as I experienced. So sometimes I have really bad days. Sometimes I have days where I I have to just go down the street to the local seal bar and, and kick a couple of beers back and just kind of be, you know, you know, just surrounded by the spirit of, of my friends, you know, that, that I've, I've laid to rest. But for the most part, I just try to focus on my gratitude. I try to focus on good times that we had when they were here. You know, I was listening to uh, one of the, the podcasts you've been on and, uh, someone asked you a question, what defines success in your, uh, in the military? And I really respected what you said. You said, you know, keeping, uh, keeping my boys happy. I think that's literally what you said. And, you know, I really respect that you were very, um, you know, um, uh, took care of your friends and just, I'm sure you guys had, uh, you know, uh, great memories together. So, uh, it's very respectable. Um, uh, you know, I kind of wanted to move on and ask you uh, about another thing, which I find insane is you've, um, you're actually an anomaly. If we think about it, a lot of veterans that retire have a very hard time adjusting back into society. It's, it's, it's a huge problem in our country and you've managed to adjust into society. You know, you've, you've gone on the entrepreneurial path. You've started your own company. You've, um, you know, uh, been successful uh why why do you think uh, how do you think you're different from uh, other veterans and what helped you readjust back into uh, society well 
I don't know if I'm any different than, than any other veteran. I think that, I think that for me, a lot of who I am comes down to how I was raised, where I was raised. You know, I have, uh, I mean, I've known suffering my entire life. I grew up in a place where it's commonplace and joining the military was my way of getting out and going, Hey, I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to try to build something for myself, but make no mistake. I never forgot what that feels like. And so I think that when it comes down to it, I just, for whatever reason, God has blessed me with resilience and, and I try to lean on that. And I try to lean on the fact that no matter how dire a situation becomes, I am never out of the fight ever. And if I get knocked down, I'll get back up every time. And when it comes down to it, that's how you have to look at life. Life is going to knock you down all the time. And are you going to stay down and cry and complain about what isn't? Or are you going to get up, dust yourself off and keep going every single time, no matter the obstacles you're facing. That's what it's about. And for some reason, that's always been embedded within me. And I, and I think, I, and I'm a stubborn person. I don't like to lose. I don't like to fail. And I'm prideful and I have a massive ego. So if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. Like I said, if I tell you I'm going to do something, count on it. Because I am not going to bear the personal embarrassment of knowing that I told somebody I was going to do something and then I didn't do it. Like, of course, I've had times in my life where I've, I've, I failed at things or the outcome wasn't exactly what I, I wanted it to be. But I will never leave a scenario having failed, knowing that it was, a, it was because I didn't put in the effort that I was supposed to. I think the other part of that question is, unfortunately, a lot of veterans deal with this burden on their own and they should not. And I learned that lesson the hard way and it almost killed me. And because it almost killed me, I went out and asked for the help that I ultimately received. And that's how I made it through. That's how I've been able to transition as well as I have, because thinking that I was strong enough and big and tough enough to do it on my own almost killed me. And I learned really quickly that I could not, that was a storm that I wouldn't be able to withstand on my own because mental health is, I mean, you can try to get in your own head and say, I'm strong enough to do this. But if you have a chemical imbalance in your head, that's preventing you from, from saying that to yourself and understanding it, there's nothing you can do about that. So I think that as a society, we have to we have to harp on our veterans that you are not alone. You don't have to carry this burden alone. Even if I'm a civilian and I'll never understand what it feels like to experience the things that you experience, I understand that it has changed you and that I have to have some patience with you because you are no longer a normal human being. And that's really important that everyone understands that. Once you experience combat, you are no longer a normal human being. You are changed forever. And I think that society also has to look at those veterans and go, we don't care. We accept you and we're going to help you however we can. Even if you're not asking for help, we're going to pry it out of you so that we can give you the help that you need. Because the reason why, or at least one of the reasons why we have a problem with veteran suicide to this day is because our veterans are lost. And some of them don't even know how to raise their hand and ask for help, not to mention the men and women that are still on active duty dealing with the fact that the military has stigmatized asking for help with mental health, you know, over the last couple of decades. These are problems that our society has to help us fix. Yeah, I believe mental health is just it's increasingly becoming more and more apparent to people that there are problems. And I think, so I, I have stu I studied at the University of Laverne and they have one of the largest uh, VA benefits in the country. And so, you know, specifically my freshman year, I had an English course 
and his his whole purpose he, he wasn't a veteran or anything but it, the whole issue was extremely serious to him and so our whole semester we just focused on books that dealt with the mental health issues and you know dealt with those issues and it just it, it really opened my mind to you know not only the hardships that you guys went through but also the mental health uh, discipline of it uh, in terms of values that you did learn, I, I mean, I'm sure you're aware, David Goggins, he's the notable Navy SEAL, um, and I, I've heard his podcast, um, I've heard an, a version of his audiobook, uh, and so he talks a lot about discipline, and a lot of what you're saying, you know, you, you get, you go down, everybody falls down, but you get back up. Uh, what specific values do you think that the average day person can take away from as you are a SEAL and, you know, apply that to their lives? I think that learning to think about others more and yourself less, I think that that's really, really helpful because I know for me personally, like I'm okay. I, I don't need much to be happy. Like I am a dude's dude. I don't need much to be happy at all. Uh, but I have people that are depending on me to to win. I have people that are depending on me to build a kingdom for my family. I have children that are depending on me to build an inheritance for their children, because that's what I'm supposed to do. So my values are all glued to my tribe and protecting those people and building something valuable that's going to provide for my tribe years after I've already left this place and I'm, I'm kicking it in the next life. So you know, it's kind of going back to what Janish was saying is that, in my opinion, if you are a leader, but you're not a servant leader, then you're doing leadership wrong. Because in my opinion, your goal as a leader should be to grow the human beings that you are responsible for leading, not to treat those people as though they are a means to your end and you being successful. If I haven't set you up so that you continue to grow and you continue to advance your position in life professionally based off lessons that I taught you, then I failed you as a leader. If you don't leave my organization, go to another organization and, and, and receive a position that's higher than the one that you had at my organization, then somewhere along the lines, I failed you as a leader. I didn't grow you the way that you trusted me to. So I think that when it comes down to it, people have to learn how to think about others. Who are the people you are responsible for? Who are the people you are setting examples for? Stop just thinking about you and what you're going to get out of this. No, you. I think when I do things, I'm thinking about six or seven moves ahead and none of them have to do with me or what I'm going to get out of it. Right. You know, speaking on growing, I want to talk about education a little bit. Um, I know you did a lot of online education. Um, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you were uh, taking online classes while you were on duty. Uh, I've personally found that fascinating i mean class online classes are difficult even like you know for the past uh two years covid everybody's been staying home taking online classes it's been difficult just taking online classes at home for me and i find it fascinating that you were able to do that on duty uh talk to me about that experience what's that like do you you know do you have to balance your uh, school work with you know what orders you have coming in from your higher ups or you know how, how is that uh, whole uh situation like i mean it just came down to time management just like anyone else you know being in the military doesn't mean that you don't have the ability to think for yourself or or live a normal life mm -hmm. um, you're working just like everyone else you've got a schedule to keep just like everyone else uh, you just have to learn to to manage your time correctly I'm grateful for online education because I was in the military and I didn't have time to go to a brick and mortar school in order to 
complete my undergraduate studies. And at that time, all I wanted to do is complete my undergraduate studies. I didn't really care what school I went to. To be honest with you, I didn't really even care what I was studying because my plan was to transition out of the SEAL teams and go over to the FBI. And I knew that I needed a four-year degree to get into the FBI. So like I said, I was thinking about things very immaturely and pretty much just like a dude in that dude. I just got to get this done. I don't care what it is. I just, I just, I, I got to get it done. And so I was grateful that online learning was there because like I said, I've already established the fact that if I make up my mind and decide that I want to do something, I'm going to do it. There are no obstacles that are going to get in my way. In this case, online education removed those obstacles for me and said, hey, you don't have to come to us. We're going to bring education to you. And I was really, really appreciative of that. And it's just a matter of, you know, you get used to things. You develop a rhythm. You get used to going to school online. Then you learn to prefer it in some cases. And I had the opportunity to experience both. I did undergrad online, and then I did graduate school at Marshall Business School up at USC. And to be honest with you, you know, looking back, like I, I really don't even have a preference because I enjoyed them both just in different ways. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I think you, uh, uh, correct, can you, what did you major in? Can you? Business. Uh, business, right. right. Mm -hmm. In uh, undergrad, I, I majored in organizational management, which is a business degree. And then I went to Marshall Business School for business and graduate. How influential do you think your four-year degree was uh, in starting your business, uh, CommaSafe AI? Well, it depends on your definition of, of influential. Can you yeah, how, how a much, little deeper uh, into that? Yeah, like how much of a role did it play? You know, do you think um, without uh, your four-year degree, you would not, we wouldn't even have started your business or you wouldn't even know how to kind of uh, start your structure, your organization, or, you know, have a plan? No, I wouldn't say that because, I mean, there are plenty of really successful businessmen and women out there that have never gone to college. There are a lot of them that are even more successful than I am, a lot more successful than I am. I think it comes down to the person. It comes down to your drive, your grit, your resilience. If you want to accomplish something and you have the will and the drive to do it, you're going to find a way to do it. Like, it, it it doesn't you know, matter what qualifications you have or you don't have. And in fact, that's entrepreneurship. You find a way to make it work. You don't have that qualification. Go find somebody with that qualification and figure out a way to get them on your team so that now the company has that qualification. I think that for me, what I took from my studies that, that, that helped me the most currently in my business, and this is coming from undergrad and grad school, is I developed a network of really smart and talented and driven people that can help me solve complex problems that I just can't do on my own. I don't care how smart I am. It's given me access to people that I can call and go, hey, have you seen this dilemma before? Yeah, I, yeah, I figured you did. How, how did you solve it? Here's my dilemma. What do you think I should do? Oh, I've seen this 12 times before. I figured I've never seen it because I spent my entire adult life in the military and I'm building this airplane as I'm flying it. You know what I mean? So I think that's the most valuable thing that I took from, from school when it comes to how I run my business to this day. If I had to put my finger on one other thing, it would be organizational structure. For sure, it would be organizational structure and understanding the importance of organizational structure and how to, how to you know, delineate between this department and that department. This department is responsible for A through Z. That department is responsible for A through Z. They interconnect at C. They interconnect at, at P. And for some reason, I don't know why, but they do interconnect at W. Okay, so now we have to figure out how do we build processes around where those interconnections are? And what's the ROI of those processes that we're building? What's the ROI of, the, of that interconnectivity between this department and that department? And how do we run these departments correctly so that we're actually achieving you know the goals that we set for ourselves in this organization and that was something that I learned going through undergraduate school online 
So in terms of the organizational structure aspect, how would you be able to relate that to um, the Navy? Because I have a friend and she was in the Naval Academy for a few years and she let me know that the hierarchical structure of it, or in her opinion, was terrible. She didn't like it at all. And that's why she ended up leaving. Um, she said that it, it didn't make sense to her. And she just, she didn't understand why a senior, which was three years older than her, was in charge of her. Um, and I'm not sure if the Navy is exactly like the Naval Academy, but I'm positive there's a hierarchical system there as well. So how would you compare that to the organizational structure that you invested your time in? Well, the military, in my opinion, is awesome. Okay, I, I have, I don't have any bad things that I can say about the military. The military saved my life and it turned me into the person that I am today. And, and I'm extremely grateful for it. But the military is like any other organization. It has its flaws. It has cancer, you know, that needs to be cut out in order to improve processes, in order to improve leadership, uh, in order to improve some of the social issues that the military is dealing with to this day. Some of those issues, you know, we're, we at CompSafe are helping the military to deal with some of those issues, uh, technologically, of course, but when it comes down to it, the military is just like any other organization. You're going to have plenty of times where you don't feel good about working for a person because you know you're smarter than they are. You know you're a better human being than they are. There's going to be a plenty of times where you have to deal with that, but that's not just in the military. You find that even in, in the commercial sector. You know what I mean? The point that I'm trying to make is the military is no different from any other organization. There are things about the military that I love. There are things about the military that to this day I don't understand and I don't agree with, but it's going to be like that no matter where you go. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Ibrahim mentioned a brief, uh, you know, gave a brief summary about what uh, commasafe.ai is, but you know, since you're here, I'm just going to ask you to kind of give a summary to the listeners about what commasafe.ai is. And a quick follow-up on that, was there a moment in your life where you thought, I really need to uh, invest into this idea because it's going to help people? Or was it something that, you know, just gradually came up uh, and you were like, I need to build a company uh, to fix uh, these problems? Sure. So commasafe AI... We are an artificial intelligence company at our core. We're based in La Jolla, California, down here in San Diego. And our flagship technology is called CommSafe AI. It's an AI-driven communication safety analysis software, hence CommSafe. Uh, it APIs into the internal communications that our companies use, or I should say our organizations, because we sell to the DOD, the government, and large companies that have more than 3,000 employees. And what this technology does beyond measuring communication sentiment 24-7 across the entire organization, but if an employee or a soldier, sailor, airman, marine sends any kind of toxic communication to another person over email or over chat. So if they're using Slack or Teams or Zoom, it doesn't matter. And by toxic communication, I mean anything around bullying, workplace violence, sexual harassment, Title VII discrimination, Title IX discrimination, anti-diversity and inclusion and belonging, extremism, all of the above. If that person sends that type of communication over email or chat, our technology will automatically label it as being a toxic message. We can quarantine it if that's what the company wants us to do. And the machine sends a real-time SMS alert to the cell phone of the decision maker or decision makers that we configure within the protocol, letting them know who just said what to who and what next step should be taken in order to cure that particular situation. Because most of the time, before we created this technology, the only people that would know that that harassment and that toxic communication and that discrimination was happening would be the victim and the assailant. Our technology has illuminated all of those instances of toxic communication that exist within an organization so that leadership can do something about it right now. Not six months from now when we're trying to figure out 
who pissed off Cedric and why did he show up to work with a gun right now? And like I said, we primarily work with the DOD government, large companies that have greater than 3,000 employees. Now, I created this company back in 2015, the end of 2015. I turned down the role that I was going to take over at the FBI, and I built this company because in December of 2015, the Inland Regional Center in San Bernardino, California, got shot up at their holiday party by a radicalized couple, one of whom was an employee of the Inland Regional Center. And after that happened, several people reached out to me asking for help at their organizations, primarily hospitals and clinics saying that, hey, we don't, we don't have anything. They're not giving us any training. There are no programs in place. We're scared. You're the only person that we know that understands this kind of thing. Will you come and talk to us about it? And after doing that several times, I decided that that was my calling and that this was a problem that I thought I could solve. So I started the company almost six years ago. I started out primarily as a tech-enabled security consultancy. And we were even called Vigilance Risk Solutions. Excuse me, was the original name of the company. And we did well, you know, we grew from bootstrap to seven figures in revenue, and we work with some pretty big and well-known companies. But coming into 2020, we knew that the pandemic was going to change the future of work. We knew that that was going to have an impact on our business model. We knew that was going to have an impact on the problem that we were trying to solve. And so we needed to keep up technologically with the solutions that we were using to attack this problem. And that's how the idea for CompSafe AI was born. Fortunately, it worked out. So we were able to go out and raise venture capital around this idea and rebrand the company around this technology because we believe it is the future of how we're going to keep employees safe in the workplace, regardless of where that workplace is. Yeah, you know, as a computer science student, I find uh, this very fascinating. Um, you know, I don't want to get too technical, but are you guys using, uh, you know, some sort of machine learning algorithms or are you guys using some neural networks? Uh, how is the, yeah, it, it's, yep. It's NLU NLP. All right. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. We appreciate, you know, your visitation, obviously you're a busy guy and we appreciate, you know, um, your commentary and, you know, answering our questions. It, it's, it's awesome. We like to have different types of people coming on the podcast, just sharing their, um, sorry, there's a fly, uh, just sharing their experiences and sharing, you know, what they've learned through life, you know, specifically yours is, is very integral to our society. And so we appreciate it. And thank you, Ty Smith. Appreciate I, I, it. And truly just one more comment. Just, I, I found your story really fascinating and really inspiring as well. So um, you know, it's, uh, you're, you're like a very motivational, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hyped now after talking to you. So thank you very much. Exactly. Thank you so much for the service of the country too. I appreciate that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I, I appreciate you guys having me on. I'm humbled by it. I think what you're doing is awesome. I think the questions that y'all asked were really, really good questions. And I think that this is really important what y'all are doing because y'all are the future you know what I mean? What I'm doing now is nothing in comparison to what y'all will achieve someday. And you need to know that there are people like me out there that started with less than a penny in my pocket. And I didn't let that get in my way. I didn't let that discourage me. I said, I'm going to go out and build something for my tribe. And I did. And I made it up in my mind that no one or nothing was going to get in my way of doing that. And y'all need to go and spread this so that other people know that it is absolutely possible to do that. Nothing or no one can stop you from achieving the goals that you set for yourself. And that's, if there's anything that I want people to take from this, that's it, that message. Go build something. Don't let anybody get in your way. Go be awesome. You are awesome. 100%. That, that's our goal. Our goal is, you know, conversation, discussion, and, you know, proliferate people's minds. And so they learn. Um, that, that's exactly you hit on the dot. I think that's a great point to end our conversation. Thank you so much, Ty, for coming out. We really appreciate your time, man. You got it. Fight on. Thank you. Fight on, man. <laughs>